Welcome back everyone to ASCII Fundamentals. Today we're talking about how and why to do startup and shutdown events in FastAPI and other asynchronous Python applications. This video is sponsored by myself. My company does code reviews, contracting, and training. Check us out at mcoding.io. All right, let's get started with a basic fast API example. Here, I just have some imports, mostly that we're going to be using for later. The only one that really matters for now is importing fast API. And then we're going to be running our application using UV corn. This is pretty standard setup at this point. When we run our application, there may be some things that we want to do on startup before we start serving any requests or on shutdown after we finish serving all of our requests. With FastAPI, you may be tempted to open up your autocomplete and let it suggest on startup and on shutdown for you. That's wrong. Deprecated, don't use them. Instead, FastAPI also has these on event decorators that you can use to specify startup and shutdown events like this. Also wrong, also deprecated. Okay, okay, they're not wrong. They do work, but they are deprecated. The issue with this startup shutdown API is that startup and shutdown are not independent events. I often want to reference things in my shutdown event that happened during startup. And I also want to reference the application itself, which in this case, if I wanted to, I would be forced to use the app global. That's fine if you only have one application, but if you have multiple applications like sub applications or just two applications running simultaneously, then that can be a problem. I'd really like a reference to the actual app. The more modern way of thinking about it is that an application has a single lifespan that includes startup events and then eventually shutdown events. In FastAPI, the lifespan is defined using a single asynchronous context manager that takes a reference to the application instance. Most often this is done using the async context manager decorator from the built-in context lib. FastAPI will run everything up to the yield as startup events and then everything after the yield as shutdown events. You can, of course, define your own asynchronous context manager manually, but the vast majority of people prefer the decorator approach, so I'm going to stick with that in this video. The way that you hook up your lifespan as the lifespan context for this particular application is by using the lifespan parameter to the FastAPI constructor. That would look like this, except of course, lifespan is defined later, so let's swap these things around. There we go, let's bring up a terminal and run our server. As you can see, we see the startup things was run during startup, and then when I do a control C to shut down, we can see the shutdown things running after I control C. So what kinds of things would you typically want to do during startup and shutdown? During startup, you probably want to log something, then you probably want to initialize any long-lived connections that your application might be using, like a connection to your database, to any AWS services you might be using, like S3, and to your caching service, like a Redis client. In order to synchronize application settings, like whether or not registrations are allowed at this time, you might have some settings that are dynamic. You could use startup as a time to pull down and initialize those dynamic settings. At which time, it's probably a good time to do some sanity checks on your settings so that you don't, you know, crash production. And then you might spawn any long-lived background tasks, like something that collects metrics periodically. Every application is different, so do what's right for you, but these are some pretty common ones. On shutdown, there's not usually as much to do, but of course there's logging, finalizing any metrics that you have, and potentially emailing DevOps to let them know that a production server just went down. Hopefully an intended shutdown. So this is how you can use a lifespan in FastAPI, and this exact same code pretty much works for Starlet as well. But this series isn't just about how to use FastAPI, it's more about learning the fundamentals and understanding what FastAPI is actually doing and how ASCII applications in general handle lifespans. Let's try to understand lifespan events in general by writing our own application class. An ASCII application is a single asynchronous callable that takes a scope dictionary defining connection details and two asynchronous callables receive and send for receiving and sending messages. By defining this thunder call method, instances of this application class are ASCII applications. See my previous video on application functions versus application classes to hear more. When we run our application, we immediately see that UVCorn receives a lifespan connection. This isn't a connection with a client, this is basically a connection with UVCorn itself that encapsulates the entire lifespan of our application. There's only a few kinds of messages that are part of this lifespan connection. First, we'll receive a lifespan startup event, which is our cue to start doing all of our startup tasks. 
Once we finish with those tasks, we should either send a startup complete or a startup failed message. You must respond to the startup message with either complete or failed. If you don't, then your application is going to be stuck and you won't even be able to kill it because as you can see here in the source of UVCorn, the server we're using, they capture signals. So if you do a control C trying to kill the program, if it's in the middle of startup, UVCorn is going to capture that signal and wait until startup is finished. It intends to re-raise signals afterwards, but if there is no afterwards because you never finished your startup, then you're going to be stuck just waiting and you'll have to kill it with kill minus nine. It's a similar story for shutdown. You receive a shutdown event and you must respond with either complete or failed. The lifespan connection is incredibly simple. These are the only six messages that you have to worry about. This is a complete list. So let's see how to implement something similar to what FastAPI does. Let's start by just taking in and storing our lifespan context manager. Then let's define this handler handle lifespan that we'll use whenever we see the lifespan connection scope. And let's just give ourselves a little bit more room in order to write this function. The only two messages that we're going to receive are startup and shutdown, so let's write those two receives. After we receive the startup message, that's our cue to start running our startup code, which means we need to enter our startup context. We enter that async context by using an async with statement, passing in the lifetime and ourselves as the application instance. Entering the async context manager runs our startup code. So if we make it inside the with block, then we successfully completed and we send our startup complete message. Once we send startup complete, our application can begin accepting other requests. In the meantime, we just await receive until we receive that shutdown event. Python ensures that our exit code runs automatically when we exit the async with block. So as soon as we do, then we send our shutdown complete message. And this is what I'd call the happy path. If everything goes well, then this is all the code. But if any of our lifetime code throws an exception, then we need to send a failed message so that our application can shut down nicely. So let's add in a try, indent all that. And we need to catch all possible exceptions here, including system exiting exceptions. So we do an accept base exception. We do re-raise the exception so that UVCorn can do whatever it needs to do with it. On the way out though, we send a failed message. The question though is, did we fail during startup or did we fail during shutdown? Well, it just depends on whether or not we successfully started or not yet. So we start out with started equals false. And then if we successfully completed our startup, then we've started. So if we fail before we've started, then it was a startup failure. If we fail after we've started, then it was a shutdown failure. So we just fill that event type in here and we're done. Running our application once again, we see that it acts just like it did when we were using FastAPI instead of our custom class. We see our startup things here. And then when I control C and scroll up to where that happened, we see the shutdown things happened. Let's compare our implementation to what FastAPI actually uses. Just like we defined a lifespan handler, both FastAPI and Starlet both pass their lifespan events down to the router. So we're inside Starlet's router class here, and it has a lifespan function, which takes scope, receive, and send. Overall, it's very similar. We start out with a started variable. We receive our first message. We have an async with entering a lifespan context. Uh, we didn't have anything about this maybe state. I'll talk about that in a second. We send our startup complete message, set started to true, and then await our shutdown message. We catch any and all exceptions, and depending on whether we've started or not, we send a shutdown failed or a startup failed message. Otherwise, we're in the nice case, and we send a shutdown complete. So what were some of those minor differences, though? The first thing is that because we're in the router class, we can't pass in self here because self would be the router, not the whole application, which is what we want. Starlet appears to be getting the application instance out of the scope, but in our case, there was no application instance in the scope. All we had was type as GUI and state, and the app is definitely not in there. Well, the scope is just a dictionary, so let's put it in there. Let's just go to our top level call function in our application. And the first thing we do anytime we receive any kind of connection is put ourselves, the top level application, as the app variable in the scope. Now, no matter how far down we are in calls, as long as we have access to the scope, we have access to the application and we didn't have to make it a global variable. Then if we wanted to, we certainly don't have to in this case, 
but we could do what they did and access the application through the scope. The next major difference was that they were actually using the return value of entering this context. They called it maybe state, I'll just use state. What's happening here is whatever you yield from the lifespan, so in here, if I yield one, two, three, that value becomes this state. So what is Starlet doing with this state? Well, first they check whether or not you did return some state, and then if you did return some state, it looks like they're treating it as a dictionary and updating the state variable inside the scope. Okay, so we can copy them if we want. We can say if the state is not none, then update our scope. Ignoring the error checking they were doing, we can just throw that in if we want to copy them. But what is the purpose of this? Taking a look at the lifespan event again, the state that we're talking about here is actually this state that's appearing in the lifespan event. So what we're saying here is that if you want, you can yield a dictionary from your lifespan function. And if you do, that dictionary will get merged into the state of the lifespan scope. Okay, so I don't want to yield one, two, three, but so what? What happens if I yield a, b? What's the point of doing something like this? Running our application again, we see our state is empty when we print it out because we printed it out basically immediately before we actually did any of the lifespan events. All we did before we printed it is add in the app variable, which is why we see the app variable here. We can start to see the purpose of the state variable when we send our first connection that's a real connection by using curl. Of course, we get an error because we haven't actually handled any HTTP messages, but UVCorn at least gives us the scope. So we see all the details of our curl request, and along with them is this state dictionary that contains exactly that AB that we yielded. This is the main purpose of the state variable in the lifespan scope. Whatever you put in there, a shallow copy of it is passed to each and every subsequent request. So if you wanted to, you could put something like a machine ID that you want to be copied and have available for every request. But in all honesty, if you're using an application class, you don't really need this because of course I could have just stored the machine ID on the application class if I really wanted to. And finally, I've saved the most useful piece of information in this entire video for the very end. Got to keep you watching somehow, right? Or wait, if the video wasn't useful, you probably would have just already left. Well, think of it as a reward then. Remember, UVCorn captures and queues up any signals that it receives during the startup phase which means that if there's a chance that something you're waiting on might wait forever, then there's a chance that you might not be able to shut down UVCorn, at least not without doing a kill minus nine. To prevent that possibility, anytime there's a chance that something might hang forever, make sure you wrap it in a timeout. If you're in Python 3.11 or later, you have this really convenient asyncio.timeout, or for earlier code, use asyncio.wait for. Same thing goes for shutdown. And if you want your shutdown code to run, even if there's an exception, then make sure that you wrap it in a try finally as well. That's all I've got. Thanks for watching. And thank you to my patrons and donors for supporting the channel. If you especially like my content, show your support by becoming a patron on Patreon. And once again, this video is sponsored by myself. Check out my company at mcoding.io. We do consulting, contracting, and training.